Hello there, it's Dr. DeMaio. This is OT315, part two of your lecture two. And this is including the orbit of the eye, some sinuses, and the rest of the axial skeleton, which includes your spine and your ribs and your sternum. Okay, so here we're looking at the orbits of the eye. We talked about this in part one. I said your textbook has a nice picture. This is a great challenge for you to do. Now re realize it's even harder if you don't have the colors. So here's your frontal bone, right? Super orbital foramen. Now inside you see these different fissures and foramen, but let's name the bones first. Frontal bone is where? Here's the frontal bone, zygomatic bone. This is the what? This one here is the maxilla. And um, this right here, this will be your lacrimal bone. This is part of the sphenoid bone, so is this up here. And then this right here is actually um, part of the maxilla here, again. A little bit of the, of the uh, frontal bone there again. And this would be part of the nasal bone right here. So now let's look at the foramen. You have a superior orbital fissure, and I want you to review the different nerves that pass through the supraorbital fissure. This is the um, optic canal, and I want you to review the nerve that passes through the optic canal, so obvious. And then here's your inferior orbital fissure. Now what nerve is passing through after it went through the foramen rotundum? Make sure you know that. And what else we got here? You also have a lacrimal duct, the tear duct here. Infraorbital foramen. What nerve passes through there? And what nerve passes through the superior orbital foramen? You should know that. Okay. Now, you, I discussed that we do have sinuses, and a sinuses is a cavern or a space within a bone. It functions in many ways, but one of the most important ways, and when I sat with Dr. Demadian, when we saw some of the brains that were filled with CSF on my patients, and that also their sinuses were filled as well. They had problems with their sinuses. And he looked at me, he goes, what do you think? And I said, well, it's part of the brain's function, the structure. In other words, when the brain drains, it has to drain it. If it's overflowing, it's going to overflow in your sinuses too. People don't realize that. So we have a frontal sinus within the frontal bone. Here's a lateral view of it showing it right here. You have a sphenoid sinus that's pretty deep inside there right way back and then you have the ethmoid sinuses of the ethmoid bone and you have two big maxillary sinuses on either side and i always talk about this you know when you're testing uh we learned how to do exams on patients as chiropractors we did these full exams when i first got out of school i was doing this full exam on all the different areas of the body and I realized their doc medical doctors are doing all that I needed to focus on their spine but in the beginning I used to take a ophthalmoscope you take the top off and it's like a flashlight and you put it up against the sinus here and here and you can see if it's congested hyoid bone not actually part of the skull but lies just inferior to the mandible in the anterior neck it's the only bone of the body that does not articulate directly with another bone the attachment point is for neck muscles that raise and lower the larynx during swallowing. And here is a some kind of crazy image of it right there. There it is. That's the hyoid bone. The vertebral column is made up of 26 irregular bones. That includes the vertebrae, the sacrum, and the coccyx. So we have seven cervical vertebrae, 12 thoracic, 5 lumbar, and the sacrum are fused vertebrae, and so are the um, coccyx. Okay. So these are 24, obviously, right? Cervical, thoracic, and lumbar. And then you have the sacrum is considered to be one bone, but it's actually five fused bones. And then the coccyx, which they didn't write here, the coccyx is actually... Uh, a bone that's fused um, four segments and this is a 
not a very good view, but you can see it in another image. By the way, next semester we're going to be going through the spine in a little more detail, ligaments and so on and so forth. But this is the um, cervical spine here. This is the thoracic spine. And there would be ribs articulating with every thoracic vertebrae. And then you have five lumbar. So seven cervical, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, and then the sacrum. Now notice these holes here. These are foramen and you have a foramen for a nerve that goes anteriorly and posteriorly. We'll talk about that later. Okay, so the vertebral column has curvatures and it has curves. Okay, so the way I always learned it is that an abnormal spinal curve is a curvature. When you have a cervical lordosis and a lumbar lordosis, and a thoracic kyphosis and the sacral kyphosis is not really a curvature. So I wouldn't use the term curvature for the normal uh, lordosis of the cervical and lumbar spine, nor would I use the word curvature for the normal kyphosis of the thoracic spine and the sacral coccyx. They're just normal curves. A curvature is looking from somebody from A to P, instead of being straight, Let's say that's their tailbone, right? They would have something like this, and there's a tail. That's a curvature where they have a scoliosis, a curvature. We have ligaments. This is a very simplified um, image. And we have ligaments that are anterior to the vertebrae by our vertebral body, and that's called the anterior longitudinal ligament. And then you have ligaments that are posterior, called the posterior longitudinal ligaments. So when you bend back, extend your head back on back, spine backwards, extension, the anterior longitudinal ligament is checking that movement. When you bend forward, the posterior longitudinal ligament is checking that movement. When I say checking it, keeping it from moving too much. Now you also have something called the ligamentum flavum. And this is forming the posterior wall of the spinal canal. Whereas the posterior longitudinal ligament forms the anterior wall of the spinal canal. So the spinal cord is coming down the center through the spinal or vertebral canal, same, same. And the posterior wall of the vertebral canal is formed by the ligamentum flavum. The anterior wall of the spinal canal is formed by the posterior longitudinal ligament. The ligamentum flavum is not really a strong ligament to check movement. It's more of protection and has flexibility to it. And then there are other short ligaments attaching, which we don't have to get into. Like right now, you have a supraspinous ligament going across the whole back of the spine. You have interspinous ligament in between. And uh, we're not going to get into that. And then you have a disc in between each vertebrae. And the disc can function like a ligament, helping to attach the bones to each other. But inside you have this annulus fibrosis, which is a fibrous connective tissue, a fibrous cartilage. And in the center is the nucleus propulsus, which is a gel in the center. Now, there are two vertebrae that do not have a disc. Do you know which ones they are? Let's talk about it later. Okay, vertebral column has intervertebral disc. We just talked about that. It's a cushion-like pad composed of two parts. It has a central nucleus propulsus. It's a gelatinous like nucleus that gives the disc elasticity, allowing for compression like a ball, like a super ball kind of thing in the center, but it's a gel. You can't see it here because it's contained by all the ligaments in the cartilage. And the ligaments in the cartilage have this annulus fibrosis of the disc, which wraps around and contains the nucleus propulsus inside. Oh, this is actually showing the nucleus propulsus. They usually show it in a different color, and it's actually showing it coming out where a herniated disc, it broke through the annulus fiber. So this fiber tears, and then the nucleus could either bulge or herniate. The difference between a herniated nucleus propulsus or a herniated disc is that it did actually escape its contained annulus fibrosis. 
whereas a bulge it would stay within the annulus fibrosus and just bulge out. So this one's showing it's causing lateral canal stenosis. There's a canal laterally that allows the nerves to come out and there's a canal centrally so it could be causing some central stenosis on the spinal cord and it looks like it's forming causing some lateral canal stenosis. So you'll see that on reports. A stenosis is compression and impedance or uh, um, closing off the space for flow. So if this was completely compressing this, you'd have complete stenosis and nothing would work. The general structure of a vertebrae. So every typical vertebrae in the body has a body. Another name for body is centrum. And the disc would be sitting in between the two bodies of the vertebrae above and below, right? So that's the body. And this is the anterior side. This is the posterior side. And the posterior side, you have a spinous process. And then laterally, most vertebrae have a transverse process. The cervical spine's transverse processes are really not well developed. And you should not have a large transverse process in the cervical spine. That would be a problem because it would press on the nerves a lot. Then the vertebrae have to articulate not only with the vertebrae above, but the vertebrae below. So you have these um, superior articulating processes in facet. This would be the facet right here. This would be the process. Uh, I'm sorry, the process is coming up at us. You can't see it. This is the pedicle. So another thing about the, here's the vertebral body or centrum. It connects to the posterior vertebrae, posterior part of the vertebrae by the pedicle. Okay, so that's what separates the anterior from the posterior and it's connected by these pedicles. Here's your spinous process, like a dinosaur spine on the top. And there's your transverse processes to the side. Each vertebrae has to articulate the vertebrae above and below. So you have superior and below it, you would have inferior articulating processes and facets. And then transversely, you would have this, um, this is actually for the ribs. The ribs can connect here to here too. So the ribs come around and connect to the vertebral body and the transverse process and go around your body like that. In the center, this is that spinal canal or vertebral canal where the spinal cord is running through. And then the spinal nerves will be coming out laterally this way from the spinal cord. This is called the lamina, it's connecting the spinous to the transverse. Sat in on a surgery on one of my patients. She had a spinal cord tumor at L1. And they removed the lamina here and here from T12 down to like L4, I believe it was. They popped off the spinuses, put them in a dish. And then what they did was they went and put clamps in and put rods all the way up. They had to rebuild L1's vertebral body. It was completely destroyed from the tumor. And they took a portion of her ilia and rebuilt it and put it on here. It's the most amazing experience. Okay, so the general structure of a vertebrae, like I said, the spinous processes project posteriorly. There it is. The superior and inferior articulating processes protrude superiorly and inferiorly from the pedicle lamina junctions. And the intervertebral foramen. Now, what is that? Do you see it here? You can't. You're hard to see it from this view. So you have a vertebral canal or foramen for the spinal cord. And then in between two bones. So the intervertebral foramen is not the vertebral foramen. That's for the spinal cord, right? The intervertebral foramen is for the spinal nerves that are exiting. And actually, it's notched a little bit. It's called a vertebral notch. And then there's a disc in between that raises it up a little bit. And then there's a space in between the two vertebrae for the spinal nerve to come out. And that's the intervertebral foramen, the IVF. So cervical vertebrae, thoracic vertebrae, lumbar vertebrae all have some differences. A typical cervical vertebrae is distinguished, like we say typical, C3 to C7 are typical. C1 and C2 are atypical. C1 
see if I go right, all right? <laughs> it's not easy with a mouse. So this is not a, this is, these are typical. This one is a typical vertebrae, right? This is not an atypical, but C1 and C2 are considered to be atypical because they're very different. Okay, I'm just going to cross that out for a minute. Okay, so you can see you have a unique spinous process on many of them. Do you see that here, the spinous process? That's called a bifid spinous process. A bifid, because it has two points coming off. Not all cervical vertebrae are bifid. Many are, but never C1 should not be bifid. And C2 is usually not bifid. Sometimes it is. Here's the vertebral body, right? Uh, now we have something different here. Uh, do you notice this hole here? We didn't have that in the typical vertebrae, did we? It's another hole going superior to inferior straight up. And that is the transverse foramen. The transverse foramen is very important. Does anybody know? You know what it's for? I can't hear you. <laughs> Obviously, I can't hear you because I'm recording this. The transverse foramen allows for the vertebral arteries to run up through there. Vertebral arteries. They run up all the way up only in the cervical vertebrae from C7 up. And they run up into the brain. When they go into the brain, they actually go up and over the atlas and then up through the frame and magnum. We'll talk about that again. Now, the transverse process of a cervical vertebrae is this. And within the transverse process is the transverse foramen. There's another name for that intertransverse ari. Inter transverse ari is another name but just remember that's where the vertebral arteries run through so on a test question if i had a ver vertebrae on a table in the lab and i put a stick through that i said name the foramen and what passes through there that's the transverse foramen and the vertebral arteries tra uh, pass through there what is this notice the shape of this vertebral canal or vertebral foramen the shape of the vertebral canal in the cervical spine is very unique. It's much bigger comparatively than the thoracic spine. It has a lot of nerve. A lot of nerves are going through that. And so it has this, also this shape, kind of like a horseshoe shape, I guess. I don't know what you would call that. And then here's showing you the superior articulating facet of this vertebrae. You can't see the inferior because it's below, right? Okay. Here's another view of the typical cervical vertebrae. You're looking at the same view we just saw before, and this is a lateral view. So here you see the superior articulating facet. Here's the spinous process posteriorly. This is the vertebral body, right? Here's the inferior articulating process and facet. The facet is the surface. The process is the thing coming down or going up. So notice they're pointing to just the facet surface here. This would be the process, and this would be the process here, and this would be the facet there. Okay, and you could see a little bit of that intertransverse foramen there, I believe. Now, this is the atypical vertebrae. There are two atypical vertebrae, or atypical cervical vertebrae, and they include the atlas C1 and the axis C2, right? And this is C1. Get that right. Don't confuse those two. Some people do. You won't, right? Actually, this is not C2. I'm sorry. See, I better get it right. <laughs> I'm thinking they were going to put that there. This is all C1 right here. And we'll see C2 in a moment. So the atlas is called C1 or atlas. It has no vertebral body. There is no vertebral body. No body. There's no spinous process. And there's no disc. There's no disc between the atlas and the skull and the atlas and C2. This is what articulates with your skull right here. And these are called the superior articulating facets of the atlas. And notice how big and broad they are. And they match 
the occipital condyles that we talked about earlier. The surface of this has the same basic um, proprioception as the surface of the condyles. So this surface has the highest concentration of mechanoreceptors, which are nerves that detect movement because your brain is exiting through this big hole. Any pressure on your brainstem could kill you. And it, actually, this is the only freely movable bone in the spine. There are no bony locks. If you look at the spine, we'll see it in the lab, how the articulating facets of the vertebrae below C2 have only a limited amount of movement allowable because they get locked into place. Whereas the atlas, if there wasn't for ligaments and muscles, it could spin around like a plate. So this is the superior view. You see how big and broad that matches the occipital condyles and the inferior view is matching more the C2 condyles. You see that? And so you have, a, you can see very clearly this foramen. That's the transverse foramen, right? And here it is again. The transverse process are very long on Atlas. See that? Very long transverse process. And within it also has the transverse foramen. And the transverse foramen is for the vertebral arteries. The vertebral arteries come up. They make a 90 degree turn over the Atlas, kind of wraps around and it goes up into the brain. So it goes up, 90 degree turn, another 90 degree turn up. And you can see how that blood vessel could get kinked in there. Okay. The cervical vertebrae, the axis C2. This is a unique vertebrae. It has this guy sticking up. Instead of a disc, it has this projection going straight up here which is going to go and pivot with the atlas, or the atlas is going to pivot on that as it turns. This is called the dens or the odontoid process. Um, it's unique to the axis, the only vertebrae in the spine that has one of these. It doesn't have a disc, remember, between C2 and C1. There is a disc below between C2 and C3, but not between this axis or C2 and C1. It's unique that 50 to 70 percent of head rotation occurs at the atlas axis joint. That's a lot of movement. So most, when you turn your head left and right, really the rest of the spine should not engage until after 50 to 70 percent of your full range of motion left or right. If you're having difficulty turning your head left and right, and you get a little discomfort and you can't quite turn it, you probably have a problem between the atlas and the axis, which could cause a whole lot of problems in your body and you don't even realize it. Okay, so here is the atlas and you see the dens coming up in the middle and it's articulating with the anterior portion, the, uh, the medial anterior portion of the atlas there, okay? And there's like a little facet on the atlas to allow it to pivot nicely. And then there are ligaments. There's a lot of ligaments here. This is called the transverse ligament. That's just one of many ligaments that are found in here. Okay, this, this is C1. And then the C2 is the axis. That's C2. And you see how this C2 has a bifid spinous. And it kind of, when you extend your head back, it fits into place in between each one of these. See how they kind of lock in. But that's not the sets I was talking about before. Those are different ones. So this is the actual spinous processes that are a bifid that can, when you extend your head back, they can give you support and help you when you extend your head back really far. Here it shows your transverse processes here. And you also, you can't see it, but the vertebral artery is gonna be running through. It's gonna go up, make a 90 degree turn over and then go up another 90 degree turn into the brain. You're going to have one on either side doing it, and then it forms the basal artery inside, which will then meet the circular willis inside your brain, meeting the internal carotid arteries. Okay, so these are regional characteristics of the cervical vertebrae and the thoracic and the lumbar. So here's the differences between the two. So you see cervical, thoracic, and lumbar. The cervical, the body is smaller, wide side to side. The thoracic has a larger than cervical. It's more heart shaped and it has two costal facets. I've talked about that before for the ribs. 
I'll go over it again. And the lumbar is massive size. It's kidney shape, the body. The spinous process of the cervical spine are unique. You have these short bifid spinuses. In the thoracic spine, they're long, sharp, and some of them go down inferiorly. The lumbar are very short, blunt, and project directly posteriorly. Okay, that spinal canal or vertebral foramen in the cervical spine, we talked about had that kind of, I said a horseshoe shape, they're saying it's like triangular shaped. The thoracic is smaller and circular. And then the lumbar again is going to be triangular shaped too. I can't do it too well. The superior and inferior articulating processes um, in the cervical spine, the superior facets directed superiorly posteriorly, the inferior facets direct inferior anteriorly. That doesn't mean much to you right now until you actually see the bones. So they have a little different shapes in the cervical spine. And then the thoracic spine, they're directed directly posterior. And what happens, the facets in the cervical spine allow for coupled movements like um, um, lateral flexion, flexion, extension, and rotation. Whereas the thoracic spine is really more for rotation only. And then the thoracic fine, spine, the superior articulating facets are directly just posted like up and down, like the facets are straight up and down. And that allows for more flexion extension strength and flexion and extension some lateral flexion a little and not much rotation the thoracic spine is more rotation and where the cervical spine allows flexion extension lateral flexion rotation your neck can move much easier than the other parts of your spine so here's a regional characteristics showing you actual images of them so you see cervical on the left thoracic in the middle and lumbar on the bottom now you know i posted this as a uh, regular powerpoint as well so if you're not enjoying these images you can open up those other images the cervical spine here are those transverse foramen right it's the body see how the shape of the body is different than the shape of the body here and the shape of the body there right the frame the vertebral canal is totally different in the cervical versus the thoracic and it's somewhat near the th lumbar but smaller comparatively one of the reasons for that is there's a lot more nerves in the cervical spine than in the and when by the time it gets down here there's less nerves but you got to realize the cervical spine and the lumbar spine are always allowing for the plexuses to go to the different limbs we'll talk about that later here's a lateral view of the cervical spine a lateral view of a thoracic spine and lateral view of the lumbar spine. Notice how big, thick, and broad everything is on the lumbar spine because there's a lot of big muscles. The spinous process in the thoracic goes down and long, right? It also has these uh, costal facets for the ribs, a superior and an inferior costal facet. And then there's even a, a, a facet on the transverse process for the ribs that come around. There are 12 thoracic vertebrae. T1 through T12, each one articulates with the ribs. If there's 12 ribs, there's 12 thoracic vertebrae. And the ribs attach to the thoracic vertebrae, they articulate and move upon. There is some movement in your ribs. The major markings include two facets and two demi facets. That's what we were talking about, those costal facets. They call sometimes call them costal or demi facets. And then there's a circular, real circular shape vertebral foramen long transverse processes and long spinous processes. The location in, of the articular facets prevents flexion, but more for rotation. Here they are. This is the thoracic spine below C7, starting at T1 to T12. And you see they have long spinous process. Each level is a little different. Notice how the spinous process sticks out a little bit here. And then they drop down more here. It's allowing for this shape, this kyphotic shape. Okay. And you can go through all the different parts of this. I want you to do that. Go through the parts of the thoracic spine. And then the lumbar vertebrae, there's five lumbar vertebrae. And they're located 
in the small of the back and have an enhanced weight bearing. They're strong, thick, short, thick pedicles, the lamina, uh, everything is kind of broad and thick to allow for support of the ones above. And the facets lock the lumbar spine together to provide stability. Okay, so here is the lumbar spine right here, L1 to L5. Notice the shape of the articulating facets are coming this way. It's more sagittal shaped, and that's for more flexion and extension. And I, I have to say it because I, I'm here teaching you guys because of this. When I was a gymnast, I was practicing a full twist on the ring, off the rings. Uh, with a, I was practicing full twist so I can do a Brannian uh, off the uh, Brannian double back flip. Basically, you do a half twist on a double back flip. And I didn't, I wasn't really a tumbler, so I kept practicing, practicing over and over. I kept landing and twisting. And I twisted my T12 and L1 so badly that it looked like one of these was mouth shaped because it was so rotated, it actually looked like it was shaped flat this way. So the orthopedist, when they looked at the x ray, they said, Oh, it looks like you have asymmetrical tropism. Wow, it's a big word. It means that one side is shaped one way and one is shaped the other way. And they thought I was had a developmental problem and they put me on, um, I do have developmental problems though, <laughs> just kidding. They put me in a back brace for three months and I lost all my abdominal strength. And finally they were gonna cut me open and I decided to try a chiropractor because my dad warned me, don't let them cut you open. So he goes, try a chiropractor. And I went to a chiropractor and within three visits, I started feeling better. But not only that, he explained everything mechanically, what was going on and also my muscle imbalances, gave me exercises. It was great. I said, this guy's the first one who really knew what he was doing. And I said, I'd like to do this. And that's how I became a chiropractor, just to let you know that. And that's how I became a teacher because I was a chiropractor. I, got out of school and I said I wanted to try and teach a little bit because I really loved my biology teacher. I wanted to be like him. All right, so sacrum um, is a tailbone. Sometimes people call it the tailbone, but it's really the, the tailbone is usually, you know, they say that the coccyx is the tailbone, but it's, they're combined, so to speak. The sacrum is actually uh, has S1 through S5, so five segments. So literally this could be S1, S2, S3, S4, and S5 down here, right? But you see coming through here is a continuation of the vertebral canal. And we call it now the sacral canal. And you have a, like a vertebral body in the front, which you can't see too well here. Uh, it's a sacral body, you wouldn't call it a vertebral body, and it has its own superior articulating facets and processes that articulate with L5's inferior. On the sides, you're gonna are, you have the auricular surface. It looks like an ear if you looked at it from the side, and there's a articulation with the ilium. That's called the sacral iliac joint. We'll talk about that more later when we talk about joints. But this hole here, what is this thing? This is the posterior sacral foramen. So S1 nerve is going through here. S2 nerve goes through here, S3 nerve goes through here, S4 nerve goes through here. These nerves go to your lower back, your legs, they help to form the sciatic nerve with the lumbar nerves as well above. And they also go anteriorly. So this is a posterior, this is the posterior nerves, but then there's an anterior view. See, we have the anterior sacral foramen. I want you to know this. See, when a spinal nerve exits the spine, it branches off into a um, ventral root, and this would be the ventral root of the spinal nerves coming in, going to your organs and your lower plexus there, down towards your, you know, your lower organs. And then on the back, it's going to the muscles of the back and the legs and so on and so forth. And this could travel down as well, right? So those are the anterior sacral foramen with the sacral nerves and if you remember your your neurology you have cranial sacral 
what is that cranial sacral is talking about the parasympathetic nerve supply is really from the cranial nerves and the sacral nerves not that the sacral nerves can't be uh, sympathetic as well some of them but generally speaking they're mostly parasympathetic okay so then here is the coccyx which is made of one two three four sometimes some authors say three some four and everyone's a little bit different everyone's anatomy is a little different and there are coccygeal nerves coming out here okay so the coccyx is made up of four in some cases three to five fused vertebrae like i said and they have coccygeal nerves exiting in between each segment okay we talk about the bony thorax that's the ribs and the sternum let's talk about the sternum first the sternum is the breastbone that people say is the breastbone but it includes the manubrium the body and the xiphoid process three parts of the sternum and then you have this costal chondro junction all this cartilage here the costal chondro junction if you notice the ribs do connect somehow to the sternum but they're connecting by cartilage now you have true ribs t1 through 7 let's count them 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 notice they come pretty direct to the sternum that's why they're calling them true ribs whereas the ribs 8 through 12 are considered to be false ribs because they all go to this big costal chondro junction and then they all come and insert into the together here see that that's why they call them false ribs and then t11 and t12 are floating ribs here's 11 and here's 12 remember that story i told you about me sitting in on a patient's spinal cord tumor that i found and she was only 24 years old and i was very worried about her and they let me sit in on the surgery the guy who did the surgery was the same one who did gloria estefan now you may not even know who she is some of you guys but she's a singer and um she had fractured her back so he did this surgery but he had a thoracic oncologist to see if it was cancerous doing opening and closing but they what they did was they took the 12th rib out before they went into the vertebrae so she was laying on her side they did an oblique cut i remember talking to you guys about oblique anatomy it's not easy they did an oblique cut from the side and they went in and removed the 12th rib put it in a dish over here i never forget sitting in a dish and i'm like what are they going to do with that you know how come they're not covering it they should put saran wrap on it i was like doting over my patient you know and uh changing the music they had heavy metal i was like play something nicer for her you know but anyhow so here's l1 vertebrae it was almost completely rotten away not really rotten away it was that she had a spinal cord tumor that took up most of the vertebrae but it wasn't cancerous thank god it was a benign tumor so to get at L1 easier, they took that rib out. Guess what? They used that rib later, and I'll explain how they did it when we talk about the pe pelvic girdle, what they did with it. We'll talk about that next class. Anyhow, so you're going to still think about this rib in the dish <laughs> before you come back to class next time. So we have 12 vertebrae, 12 ribs. You have uh, seven true ribs. And then you have uh, 8 through 12 of the false ribs. Out of those false ribs, the last two are floating ribs. When the guy took these ribs out, he said, he took both of them out, I believe. He said, you know, Cher had her ribs removed, you know. I said, why? He said she wanted to make her hips narrower, or her waistline narrower. Crazy stuff, huh? Okay, so this is showing you what the, per the functions of the thor bony thorax are. It's to form a protective cage, just like the skull protects the brain, the vertebrae protect the spinal cord. And uh, so you have this protective cage um, around the heart and lungs and all the great vessels. It also supports the shoulder and the girdles and the upper limbs, it provides attachment for many neck, back, chest and shoulder muscles. And it uses the intercostal muscles to lift and depress the thorax during breathing. 
The sternum, like I said, is a dagger. It's, we talked about it. It's dagger shaped, I guess. It has like a sword, like a manubrium, a body, and a point, the xiphoid process. So it's actually the fusion of those three bones. You have the manubrium, which is like a handle, the body, which is like the big portion of the sword blade, and then the point is the xiphoid process. Anatomical landmarks, which is important, is the very top, the suprasternal notch. That's a very important location. And then you have the sternal angle and the xiphosternal joint. Here we go. Suprasternal notch or jugular notch is the same thing. All right. All right. Uh, there are 12 pairs of ribs forming the flaring sides. All ribs attach posteriorly to the thoracic vertebrae. We saw that. And they do move. The superior seven pair are called true. They're vertebrosternal. That's another name for the true ribs, the vertebral sternal. And they attach directly to the sternal via the costal cartilage. Ribs 8 through 10 are false or vertebral chondral going to the cartilage. And then ribs 11 and 12 are floating. They have no anterior attachment. The structure of a true rib, it's bowed, flat bone consisting of a head. Here's the head. A neck and it has a shaft. There's also intercostal grooves for the blood vessels and nerves that come around. But see how the ribs articulate with the vertebral body here at the superior costal facet. And then over here on the transverse process at a, um, a demi facet there as well.